Greetings, I am V5C1, and welcome back to Greatest Battles. In this episode, I and my successor are sent into the field of battle, where my successor wins a match after having blocked a punch that should have destroyed her. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's see something amazing. For science. And entertainment, of course. Nobody expected this round to be notable. This was just a routine land, complete the mission, and place as high as you can, session. Nobody expected me to do something so amazing that it warranted a mention and showing on greatest battles, and yet, here we are. I will be gliding past the citadel, a place where one of the most powerful natives once resided. They only referred to him as the ageless champion. His armor looked incredible, and he had mighty weapons to match, but otherwise, it was fairly easy to take him out. So much so that the SDA would regularly land there for that express purpose in the first place. At least, whenever it was a duo or squad visiting it. If only a single soldier visited the Citadel, the Ageless Champion was usually ignored, as many other loopers, far more skilled than the Vaxi battle droids would ever be, would also land at the Citadel for the same purpose. I still find myself wondering whatever happened to them all when Mega City dropped onto the island through the rift torn through the sky. They just seemed to vanish afterwards. Even this so-called Rift Warden Stellan vanished after it appeared. But, I'm getting off track. Now, I've landed at the harbor, and already made some progress on the mission to collect Oathbound items. The Excalibur rifle will also serve me well in the mission to come. I search the pier for a chest, making multiple double-take-like actions, and once I grab the chug splashes, and find it, I search it, getting a big pot in the process. I will soon be talking to the pistol vending machine, who congratulates me on winning a crown in a previous match, then warns me to watch my back whilst I'm wearing the victory crown. You do seem to be targeted when you're wearing the crown, because the other loopers want to win while wearing it for bragging rights. I get it, it's pretty challenging to win while wearing the crown, mostly because of that reason, so the more crown wins you get in a season, the more, during that selfsame season, impressive you'll be. After the season ends, the crown wins are reset, and all you and whoever you show those wins off to will have left to the memories. For example, Twig Stomper has eclipsed 100 crown wins at least twice since he came to meet Jester and Spider-Man. Ever since then, things have either gotten harder, or he just simply lost interest in Battle Royale entirely. Regardless, those instances of over 100 crown wins have been documented into his ever-growing permanent record. Now, here's where I explain myself where it comes to saying the Ageless Champion was one of the most powerful natives on the island, then took a heel turn and said he was fairly easy to defeat anyway. Out of all of the natives, you know, the people that were on the island before the loopers land from the battle bus, he was indeed the most powerful native out of all of them at the time. I don't think even the cold-blooded suits that rifted in starting in the most wanted event could hold a candle to him. However, the SDA and SMC have a secret weapon that shreds through his health and shields like paper, Twig Stomper. I cannot explain Twig Stomper accurately without throwing in the word prodigy. Despite how long he's been in the SDA, his skill is legendary. There's a reason he's the third, and most skilled, member of the greatest trio. He is an architect, he is a ferocious soldier that even the most sophisticated droids have fallen to when he gets serious, and we're honestly fortunate that he's on our side. If the SDA or SMC had to fight him, or, even worse, Great Gunner or Spirit Eye, we would have a long, hard war. Not that we don't already with Carnage having resurfaced with the most devastating embedded order in the SDA's history. I, among many others, hope that the war will end soon. We have suffered a tremendous loss, and tensions are rising with a general of the Fox Clan, who has threatened to destroy our bases if the Fox Clan finds Drift Beetle first. Now I'm heading upstairs in this castle, with Excalibur, Falcon Scout, and Guardian Shield in hand. At this point, I have collected 7 out of the 9 Oathbound objects I needed. I'm not entirely sure when it counts, and when it doesn't count, but it seems like the progress on this mission was inconsistent. I fell down onto a ledge of the castle, however, it didn't seem far enough down to cause any damage. However, it did trigger a brief self-preservation alert in my heads-up display. This is akin to an organic soldier's heart rate increasing due to a scary fall, but that's the closest we battle droids come to truly experiencing fear. 
For battle droids, emotions are harder to feel or express than by an organic looper, as we are programmed for specific purposes, and if the emotional state doesn't match our programmed limitations, we cannot express that emotion. For example, we cannot express excitement or intense joy, nor can we express sadness. We can, however, express satisfaction, anger, protectiveness, frustration, fear, and disappointment. We can't express sadness, as, due to this island's unique logic and physics, death by falling, gunshots, bludgeoning, electrocution, slashing, explosions, or suffocation in both forms don't stick, and thus, the affected looper can return as good as new. It would be pointless to mourn when the looper you're mourning comes back behind you and asks what did I miss. There are very few instances where death actually sticks, but that, in itself, is super rare. We cannot express excitement or intense joy because we were programmed to be serious. The only reason anger is allowed is because if the anger is justified, the SDA would win without their conscience bothering them. I managed to eliminate this particular looper with a single shot from my Excalibur rifle. I would bet they were shocked and devastated to have won against one opponent, only to be eliminated so easily. As per our protocol, I collected the enemy's supplies, and moved on with the rest of the match. Now I am browsing my augments, trying to choose some of the best ones to fit my needs in future combat. I picked Rarity Check firstly, and Splash Medic second, because the more ways I could heal, the longer I could last, and the more chances I could get in the long run to deal the required damage with the Excalibur rifle. I then tried to tell my opponent through the calculated emote that I managed a calculated elimination against them. However, they had already left. It's true, I snuck up to them where they couldn't see me, and quickly blasted them while they were healing, eliminating them efficiently. However, I was soon after caught in the storm, and forced to follow the storm wall to the next predicted eye. I have heard that a marine battle droid was once caught in the storm, and the effects scrambled its processor so badly that it mistook one color of beacon for a similarly colored beacon. It was, understandably, brought into the lab for repairs, then it was released back into the field once it and the rest received new, storm-proof sensors and processors. If one of us had been malfunctioning, Jester would have to send us to Y Labs for repairs, having a pristine model escorting us there. However, none of the battle droids from Y Labs have malfunctioned like that, albeit that doesn't mean we didn't malfunction at all. Recently, we were experiencing glitches in our systems that would force us to look up against our will, which, as you may be able to imagine, is detrimental to a battle droid deployed on the battlefield. Those glitches seem to have been corrected, but whatever caused them was worrying, to say the least. I splash myself with the chug splash that I got from the produce box courtesy of the splash medic augment, and restored my systems with them. I also did so with the produce that also came from it, all but one coconut. I then retrieved my big pot, and proceeded to search the chest in this house for supplies. Out came a guardian shield, my ninth and final oathbound item that I needed to complete the mission. At least, for stage 2. In stage 3, my progress was reset, and I needed 18 instead. At the very least though, inconsistent or not, it was possible to get progress on the mission sometimes, so I wasn't worried about it, especially since I wouldn't be able to collect all 18 in this match anyway. I don't even know if we'll show completion of the mission or not. Most likely not, since that wasn't a priority at the time. Back then, the top priority were the Oathbound quests, the then current storyline. I have heard, and seen firsthand, that that is no longer the case, as, since Justice Jester started his Task Force Vixen series, we have moved back to the original format, and started going back to completing weekly quests. We will also be prioritizing the special quests, like those that would unlock Ahsoka and her rewards. So stay tuned for that, and we'll be showing those off, much like Justice Jester will the snapshot quests. I grab some more shotgun shells, which somehow conjures up purple energy in the form of swords within the Excalibur rifle. Once fired, the swords would later explode, dealing massive damage to any enemy in the area. Obviously, hitting the enemy, then having the swords blow up on them, deals the most damage out of the two methods of using the Excalibur rifle in all but fall damages case. However, as I'm in the reality where building is impossible, fall damage is harder to achieve, and thus, direct damage is in fact the best option. Here we see arguably one of the best rift events I could have asked for, because of the supplies that came with it. 
Although, I didn't know how to feel about the chests at the time, as I had a weapon through which an elimination of my opponent would grant me siphon, but, at the same time, I couldn't resist, due to a daily quest. Out popped a DMR, which I promptly ignored. The other chest had pretty well identical supplies. At least, the main weapon was identical. The medical supplies were different, because the first chest contained a med mist, whilst the second held minis. Now I'm up against another opponent. I fired my Excalibur rifle at the enemy, setting off multiple gas cans. However, none of them hit him, and he was taken out by one last blade. That's certainly the other way of using the Excalibur rifle that I was mentioning earlier, setting a trap, and making them walk right into it. However, it doesn't always work, and thus, you have to go for the more direct approach instead. Now that that was done, and most of this section of the building was ruined, and most of the gas cans within this section had detonated, I moved on to briefly inspect what remained, then moved on with the rest of the match. I see gunshots on my sonar, and move in to investigate. However, it seemed that the opponents were in the storm, and when the aforementioned storm catches up with me, I then take a left turn and made my way into the next predicted eye instead. The gunshots continued to my right as the storm closed in behind me, but as I couldn't hear the shots, yet my sonar could pick them up, the fight must have been pretty deep in the storm. As such, I decide that this would be the best time to choose my last augments, going for Bush Warrior and Shotgun Striker, wondering if the Excalibur rifle, which used shells like a shotgun, would grant siphon like a shotgun as well. I would soon have an opportunity to try it out, as I saw gunshots in front of me. This time, the storm would not hold me back, and I would go straight to my opponent, in an attempt to get more progress on my mission, and as an experiment for the augment I just chose. Fortunately for me, the gunshots were coming from the direction of the next predicted eye, so I just kept going, even making my way up this hill. I scanned the area for opponents once I got to the top, and as I was doing so, I went too close to the edge near Solitary Shrine, and slid down the nearby slope. I didn't let that dissuade me though, as I made my way to the shrine. There was very clearly a firefight going on, and I wanted an, so that I could get progress on my mission. Don't worry, I still have a little over 3 minutes left, so these opponents won't eliminate me. I mean, after elimination, it would not take 2 or 3 minutes for me to save the clip, don't you think? Regardless, I'm going in. I fired my Excalibur rifle at both of my opponents, hitting the one beneath the stairs on my first attempt. I nearly hit myself with my own blade just a second ago, but once I avoided it, I resumed my offensive. As I made my way out of the shrine, the opponent I hit with the blade defeated the opponent I missed, so my final battle against the opponent I hit had begun. They disoriented me by going inside the shrine, as I didn't know where in the shrine they went, and they may have taken a launch pad out of the shrine to escape me. However, I was determined to hunt them back down, and finish what we started, whether they wanted to or not. I surveyed the land as I glided through the air on my hyperboard, trying to find my opponent. When they had completely and successfully lost me, I then decided to search the chest in this lab. Inside was yet another twin mag SMG, chug splash, a shockwave hammer, and light bullets. This gave me progress on the mission to collect oath-bound items, and I camped in the lab, looking over mission progress in the meantime. When I left the lab, I heard the sounds of bullets hitting the nearby environment, and started feeling like someone had spotted me, and was itching to pick a fight with me. I investigated where the shots were coming from, ready to accept the challenge, not only to complete my mission, but to teach this looper a lesson about what happens when you threaten me. At this point, I had eliminated three opponents, each of them with the Excalibur rifle. Once they were eliminated, the mission heads-up display reported a total of 790 damage for the mission. Someone fired off a powerful beam called the Kamehameha in the distance. After they had finished, I fired two swords from my Excalibur rifle, and missed both times. After I'd missed with my second blade, the opponent retreated somehow. Another opponent fired another Kamehameha, then as I made my way to the door of the lab, I saw the looper take the launch pad in the castle on the mountain to glide near the lab I was hiding in towards the mountain to the right. I hide briefly, then aim at the gliding opponent. However, they eventually vanished behind the mountain, though another opponent was walking up on my left. 
At first, I was unaware of the enemy, as I was trying to scope out the one that had just went behind the mountain. However, once I noticed that on my sonar, I then switched targets to the one that posed the most immediate threat. And, speaking of the ageless champion, I do believe I have engaged him in battle. I mean, sure, it's not the, real, ageless champion, but the appearance is unmistakable, real or not. They attempted to destroy me with the Kamehameha, but I thought quick and shielded myself from the beam. Now, was this enough to survive? With me attempting to use the Excalibur rifle from point blank, I would say no. However, I put up a valiant fight anyway. This match is notable for me doing something that should have been impossible. And since my predecessor already told you what that was, I'm not spoiling anything. She already has. However, Greatest Battles is all about notable plays that members of the SDA and SMC have managed. It's kind of warranted to be excited to tell about notable events such as these. However, we've only provided information on what you can expect, not when it occurs or what all transpired before the blocked punch. So sit down and relax, grab some popcorn or whatever snacks you enjoy while watching YouTube, and I will commentate on what I see going on right now. Sorry, but I'm not going to spoil the exact timestamp. You're just gonna have to watch. Or, if you want to, and know how to, skip to that exact moment, I guess that's fine too. To each their own after all. I was harvesting some slap berries at this point, and once I'd collected the berries from the now destroyed bushes, I march on to my next destination, stopping to eat the berries, gaining shield and temporarily unlimited energy. It's actually fascinating that battle droids can consume these like organic loopers, and still gain the effects. Realistically, anything other than compatible fuels would gum the works of any machine, and any energy above the designated norm is also detrimental for a machine. As one of our other battle droids mentioned before, if you overload a machine, the best case scenario is a crashed system, requiring repairs. The worst case scenario is that, if it was overloaded enough, or in the right way, a machine could explode, taking anything nearby with it. It is very recommended that you pay attention to all the warnings on any machine so as to avoid both scenarios. I have now opened my first chest, getting from it a med kit, machine SMG, and light bullets. For whatever reason, I'm avoiding the machine SMG, and taking only the med kit instead. Also, for whatever reason, I thought there was a chest in the non-existent attic up above. When I see that there was nothing there, I move on with the rest of the match. This takes me on a downward slope to the beach below. Or, more accurately, the harbour my predecessor visited first in her own match, where she blocked the Kamehameha. I opened the oathbound chest here, as we still had the mission to collect 18 oathbound items. Unless I'm accessing the wrong files and I'm actually in the fourth and final stage of the collect oathbound items quest, I wouldn't even be a little surprised. After finishing with the harbour, I make a beeline to the castle on the hill, and sprint at least most of the way due to my now limited energy in my sprinting systems. I walk the rest of the way, or, I guess you could say, ran the rest of the way, since it has been hard to walk since Chapter 3 Season 2. I then make my way through the automatic doors, and jump onto the platform on the left to search yet another oath-bound chest. Inside, I found an Excalibur rifle, which, if I'm accessing the right files, I'm still not done with yet. Here, I'm drinking the big pot, getting my shield the rest of the way full. Alongside increasing my chances of surviving, it also completed a daily quest, which, regardless of format, is just a little bonus for any series, Fortnite Follies and Greatest Battles alike. I also briefly debate searching the nearby toolbox, then decided against it, and jumped down, resuming my search for more oath-bound chests or items. I then climbed onto this platform, but to my disappointment, I only found a normal chest. I searched it anyway, because there's still a chance to get oath-bound items out of a normal chest, but I instead got a tactical pistol, some grenades, gold bars, and light bullets. After examining the DMR, I decided to climb up the stairs to the upper floor, and decided to replace my shockwave hammer with the DMR, and went back to do so. Then I made my way back up the stairs into the upper floor to search for more oath-bound chests and items. On the third floor, I found yet another normal chest, and searched it, getting the very shield I used to block the killer punch this clip is notable for. 
I almost immediately grabbed the shield, because I still had the Oathbound items quest to do. But this time, the items in my loadout were still organized in the old-fashioned way, but after an argument with Twig Stomper in one creative session, we received the order to use Spider-Man Canada's method of organizing our items, a method we've stuck with ever since. But, more on that later. Right now, let's focus on the here and now. Or, what was back then the here and now? I had searched a rare ammo box, which contained a lot of ammunition for many different weapons, including the Excalibur rifle currently in my inventory. And besides the DMR, the Excalibur rifle was the only weapon I had at the time. So, it was vital to keep a healthy supply of shells and medium bullets for the two weapons I had. Fortunately, the shield, despite taking a while to recharge, had unlimited energy, but the rest required ammunition to fire. I'm starting to wonder if I was actually going for quests, or just training in the field, as I ignored that guardian shield, despite probably needing to collect oathbound items. I have participated in dozens of matches since, so the data from all of them meld together until they are picked apart and identified. The main thing I know about this match is that I won, and I achieved what should have been impossible. At this point, I entered this castle, and started searching its confines for more supplies. Which, at this point, was for a better DMR, Excalibur rifle, or more ammunition, medical supplies, and building materials. Guardian shields only ever had one rarity, but if there were better guardian shields, I would say that the improvement would only be in how long it could be used, since it was a defensive utility item instead of a weapon. As of the time that I picked up that new Excalibur rifle, I can now confirm that I do, in fact, need to collect oathbound items still, and furthermore, confirm that the target goal was 18. So, what happened there with the other guardian shield? Why did I pass that over? yet grab another Excalibur rifle. My idea at the time eludes me currently, but it may be because of how sporadic progress was on the quest when you picked up certain items that you could only carry one of, such as the Falcon Scout and Guardian Shield. I believe that you can hold only one of the two items. And no, I'm not suggesting that they are mutually exclusive to each other, I mean you could only hold one Falcon Scout, and only one Guardian Shield. You could hold both a Guardian Shield and a Falcon Scout in the same loadout, however. I was caught in the storm here, so I had to hurry to the next predicted eye as fast as possible. Despite being at half my system integrity, and relatively deep in the storm, I passed by some slap berries. However, the next predicted eye was in sight, and I still have 13 minutes and 7 seconds. As such, with me having won the match, I'm not even remotely worried about my then current situation especially as I was close to the current guy with 24% system integrity. And if you're wondering why we droids say system integrity instead of health, the answer is actually quite simple. As we are not biological beings, we are immune to some of the things organic soldiers suffer from, such as sickness and disease. Somehow, we are still affected by stink bombs, and for obvious reasons, we are still susceptible to gunshots. The effects of the storm is a bit of a grey area, as we can't tell whether it's corrosive, or electrifying, or both, or if it affects loopers in some different, unknown way. After a certain amount of time spent in the storm, you will get storm sickness, which may provide some form of hinders to the storm's effects, but that is merely speculation at the moment. However, if it was some form of radiation, which is what we speculate, then that is a scary thought to consider. However, given its purple hue, it's not the standard radiation. From the files logged into Y-Lab servers, the purple hue matches that of a threat so serious that it took the island flipping to put an end to. They called her the Cube Queen. It's fascinating that these so-called corruption cubes are the exact opposite of the spherical zero point in every way. Shape, function, alignment, they are two sides of the same coin. Sphere and cube, creation and destruction, good and evil. Only one cube has ever been good, from what my predecessors have said. A particular blue cube, which had supposedly been revived by the Loopers whilst in the mothership. That same cube was destroyed during the final battle against the Cube Queen, so it never got a chance to betray us if that was ever its intention. And before you chide me for talking about cubes like they were sentient, think about this for a moment, the Cube Queen had to command them somehow, so they had to at least have the intelligence of dogs to obey. Or maybe you're right, and she just psychically moved them into place. Who knows at this point? 
All I know is that they fell to the island after the mothership explosion, and were scattered around, then brought back together into a pyramid. At this point, the storm was moving again, but it was 1 minute and 51 seconds away, so I had time to get to the eye, even if I was struggling here. I moved around this ledge, and climbed up the hill beside it, continuing my journey to the next predicted eye. As predicted, I was close enough to the eye that I wouldn't take any damage from the storm this time, not that I wouldn't be able to repair myself by hiding in a bush due to an augment. This device, handed to us by Amy, has been a lifesaver on more than one occasion. It alters reality based on what you pick, but only the reality of the user. For instance, if one looper picks forecast, not everyone in the squad can see the next two predicted eye as the affected looper can. Same with Bush Warrior. Not everyone in the squad can hide in the bush and recover health, system integrity, and or shield. The exception is if two or more loopers pick the same augment. The point is, most, if not all, augments work on an individual level. Now, I'm fighting against some sort of walking anemone. As I thought, I hadn't completed the mission before my last opponent to deal damage with the Excalibur rifle. There was another augment demonstration by that anemone, an augment called Rift Jector Seed. Once you got to a certain threshold of health or system integrity, the augment would rift you into the sky so that you could make your escape. Whether or not the anemone will take this chance that they were given, I don't currently know. However, they would be wise to run as far away as they can, as I wasn't playing around. I would eliminate them with my Excalibur rifle if given the chance. Another thing I would do if given the chance is repair my systems with bandages which I seem to be getting here since nobody knew exactly where I was. Then again, I do still have 9 minutes and 5 seconds. I got marked here, I think either by a capture point, or by the storm mark augment. I break these slurp barrels to repair my systems fully, as I anticipated that I would be fighting again soon. Once my systems were fully repaired, I then move on with the rest of the match, ready to eliminate any looper in my path if need be. And given this one fired their weapon at me, I do believe that I'll need to fight here. So, I took out my Excalibur rifle, and got ready to blast them. They managed to shred through a majority of my shields, so I retreated to set up an ambush against my assailant. I attempted to use the counter as cover, firing upon them with my Excalibur rifle in the process. Right there is where I managed my first direct hit on my assailant, dealing a massive amount of damage. I had to reload there, but once I had, I was ready to continue the fight. And that happens to be the finishing blast, as Albert couldn't survive any more damage. I then move on to grab the ammunition, and gold he dropped, then I made my way back to the front of the restaurant. Once I got to the front, I rushed behind the counter. While behind there, I debated drinking the minis. However, once I was hidden enough, and felt secure, I looked around, spotted some nearby slap juice grabbed them, then drank them to get my shields up to 60%. Once I finished, I drank the big pot, getting my shield the rest of the way full. Once that had finished, I then checked my list of missions I had left to do, heading to the weekly tab to view my progress. Here, I found that I still had to hit 11 headshots, and collect 13 more oathbound items. However, as this is greatest battles, and since Fortnite Follies has already finished this season, you won't see this quest get completed unless I've somehow managed to get a win or some sort of amazing play that's been recorded prior to March the 12th. That's the date that the first Greatest Battles clip was saved in Chapter 4 Season 2. I don't know how many episodes away that is, so don't ask me, but it will be a while, be you rest assured of that. We are only just getting into the February clips at this point, and there are a few of those, so get comfortable, it'll be outdated footage for a while. Another opponent has started shooting at me at this point, so I turn to face them, then go on the hunt for them. At the time, all I knew is the direction from which the bullets were fired at me. With this basic information, I run towards the shots, getting ready to engage my next enemy. I then head over to the gas station to investigate, seeing as how I couldn't otherwise find my opponent. I then find a follower on top of the gas station and scope them out. I could tell that they were a follower because they had an exclamation mark over their head, guards won't exist until around 5 episodes later, and there weren't any natives patrolling the gas station, least of all having access to the roof. And with any follower, they led me to an opponent that I proceeded to shoot in the head. 
After three successful headshots, I eliminated the opponent, the follower, Helsi, following behind simultaneously. I then proceeded to struggle to climb up to the gas station roof where my opponent had been before, and once I finally reached the top, I picked up their victory crown and supplies, mostly their ammo, and then went on my merry way. Alongside the two preceding items I described, I also grabbed a Maven Auto Shotgun, the best type of shotgun at the time for the majority of the Seven Droid Army. I'm sorry to those of you who think the Thunder Shotgun is better, as we of the SDA don't agree. However, we're not going to condemn you for using it if you are better at using it than the Maven Auto Shotgun, but we are the opposite in that case. I saw that an opponent was nearby here, so I jumped down to search for them, then when I caught sight of them, I took aim at them. By the time I could draw a bead on the Ageless Champion, they had already escaped, and another opponent opened fire. I engaged them in combat, once again trying to shoot them in the head with my DMR, hitting one time, and missing the rest. It looked like they were trying to retreat, but then they came back to begin their assault anew. This proved to be their final mistake, as they were eliminated by a body shot. Not exactly ideal for me, but I shrugged off the disappointment, and carried on, as there were still three opponents left. Before I moved on to what would be my final showdown, I grabbed the legendary Excalibur rifle, the second most powerful to exist, right behind the Ageless Champion's personal Excalibur rifle itself. Now, if I'm accessing the right files, and my other opponents hadn't moved from that direction, I should have remembered where they went at that point. I indeed head in the general direction that I saw the Ageless Champion chasing another opponent. There was a looper gliding to my left, but we ignored each other as I moved on with the rest of the match. Ah, uh, here we go. This is the general location where the opponent with the killer punch decides to attack me. However, it will still be a while before they show up. I searched the cooler for whatever reason, and out came a flopper and some chug splashes. As I was debating taking them, the ageless champion came right up behind me with the very thunder shotgun I was talking about a while ago. Through a practical demonstration, I will show you why I prefer the maven over the thunder. It's a question of firing rate. I scared off the ageless champion, and I still tried to eliminate him as he's retreating. Simultaneously, someone scanned me with the falcon scout. The moment we've all been waiting for is about to begin. While it wasn't enough to talk about, the Ageless Champion did damage me during the fight, so I picked up the chug splashes, throwing one so far out that it was a waste, then smashing the other at my feet. Now with only 20% more shields, I decide to look at my augments while still hiding under this bus stop, settling for shotgun striker and rushing reload, which would be very helpful in the fights to come. I then looked through my augments one last time. One such augment was party time, though since I dropped my hammer in favor of the DMR, and this was my last augment, disallowing me from getting aerialist, it was harder for me to justify selecting party time. As the storm alarm went off, I tensed up, readying my Maven auto shotgun. The ageless champion returned on his cloud, and I prepared to fight him, once again prioritizing headshots. Those two last headshots were more than he could survive, and instead of retrieving his shockwave hammer, he lost everything he had in his loadout. As usual, I pick up the ammunition he dropped, then moved on back to the bus stop as two of my opponents fought, and the runner-up in this match had won the fire fight. Even without knowing that I won, I feel like I had a fighting chance to win anyway. I had an eye impenetrable shield, an augment that capitalizes on close range combat and heals you per every shot hit, and an overall decent loadout. The only thing not in my favor is that, outside of the Maven Auto Shotgun, I had nothing to restore my health or shields. In other words, I'd have to shoot, hit, outlast, and eliminate my opponent in order to survive, let alone win. Challenge accepted. I waited patiently for my opponent to show up, as I still had headshots to hit. Why not make a preemptive strike, you may ask? Simple. Aggressive preemptive strikes often led to Marty Jester's elimination in the past, so he's learned from them, and warned us against them as well. Ambushes work better for most of us, so that's what I was sticking with here. The storm is closing in again, making getting hit by Deku Smash progressively more dangerous. And yes, I do realize that I just revealed the name of what I kept calling the killer punch, but honestly, if you couldn't tell that I was describing Deku Smash the whole time, then I don't know what to think about you. I think I heard them jumping around behind the bus stop just now. 
Nevertheless, I know they are searching for me, as I'm the only opponent between them and victory. Even though I'm sure I heard them, I could not see them, no matter what side I looked around to see where they were. However, I was determined to see them first, before they saw me. My combat programming was primed and ready to go. The final showdown has begun, and they managed to knock me back into the storm with their shockwave hammer. However, I managed to get back into the eye despite all the assault rifle rounds they were firing. And this is the moment I and my predecessor were talking about. They were trying to pierce my guard with Deku Smash here. I was technically taking a gamble, but it paid off. No damage, and no knockback. I had annihilated their ace in the hole at that exact instant. They would soon follow with one last shotgun blast to the head. And that appears to be all the time we had for today. Join us in the next episode when, an Arctic series destroyer goofs around with Spider-Man and Twig Stomper, and Jester is taken down, leaving it up to his friends to win the game for him. In the meantime, thanks for watching, we hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you all next time. Until then, farewell.